chose not to. So basically, in you know, Western Europe and the United States, though, they, there's pretty well synchronized what we call the major recessions. And every 10 years, there's a major recession, approximately. Every 9 to 11 years, you'll see there's two exceptions in the seven years. But they might be explained by other things. Um, so ascension, that's kind of remarkable. So even like you know, in uh, the 1860s, economists were saying, that the, the, the recession phenomenon that we have today seems to be an industrial production phenomenon, a, 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 a phenomenon of factories. It doesn't exist before the Napoleonic Wars, which are from 1795 to 1815. It doesn't really exist before 1815. Britain is the only country that has really an industrial revolution in the 1770s and 1780s. So Britain's the only one that really has serious factories by that point. By 1815, France has factories, and you start seeing this phenomenon in France, that is the modern recession and business cycle. <clears throat> the United States has such factories by 1820, and you start to see this phenomenon there, and Germany has this by the 1860s. Japan by the 1870s, Russia by the 1890s, blah, blah, blah. So as countries become industrialized, they seem to get into this format, this, this behavior. But in, by the 1860s then, particularly British economists had noticed in Britain a phenomenon. That is that roughly every 10 years, there was what they called a crisis. It turned out to be, it seemed to be, to begin with a stock market crash. And so all these great uh, recessions look like they begin with a stock market crash, or at the very least a stock market crash seems to come early on. It seems not to be what starts the recession, but the recession caused the stock market crash. But leave that alone for the moment. So what they observe is an obvious thing. Every 9 to 11 years, there is a spectacular stock market crash. Everything crashed. No, people are really happy when the stock market is going up, their money's going up and up, and then it crashes. For, and then, it, 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 then an in the, 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 the subsequent year, two, three years, whatever it is, what you have is, Firms going bankrupt, un uh, people laid off or fired or whatever it is, unemployment rises, um, and output falls, and there's lots and lots of excess. In most markets, you'd have too many goods produced, prices fall drastically, right? And this takes a period of time. What causes this? We don't know. How it turns around, we don't know. There's lots of explanations. We're going to talk about one today or not in this course. But, what I want to point out to you, which you don't normally see in the economic textbooks, is that this actually literally does happen every 9 to 11 years. So I'm just looking at the spectacular stock market crashes that the worst in 10 years, that ushered in, or were somehow at the beginning of, a period of huge unemployment, rising unemployment, bankruptcy of firms, falling prices, etc. And these are the days, all the spectacular stock market crashes. This is in Britain, because Britain's the only relevant one, up, really, the main one before my 1873 dollar. 1825, 36, 47, 57, 66. You can see, there's 11, there's 11, there's 10, there's 9, right? Boom, 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 boom. This is 7. Unusual, but perhaps it's caused by the fact that, that you know, Germany, France, and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, the U.S. essentially enter. Maybe there's something to do with that, it doesn't matter. Then, they're not, countries don't always have the stock market crash the same year. But you can see Britain, then United, Britain 1882, United States 83, Britain 90, United States 93, well, this 73, 83, 93, 1992, 1913. Again, almost exactly 10 years. 1913, notice, is before World War I. World War I interrupts that, but still 1920. Again, 1929, again, 1937, there's eight years. Then 49, World War II, but notice it's 20 years from here to there. 60, 70, 81, 1990. I can pick these up, I can pick these up, for all I can show you, but it's still pretty striking, 2001. What is unusual about this? It came early, and it's worse. So basically for me, when I talk to you, I'd say, we could expect, we're going to expect another stock market crash that is associated with a recession, falling, you know, a lot of unemployment, falling prices, blah, 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 blah. 
probably around 2019. That's when it's going to happen. Right? 2018, 2019, maybe 2020. But it's going to happen. Because that's what happens after 10 years. So this is what I'm interested in. But in general, now as I say, when this was first discussed in the 1870s, it was a concept of a crisis. Now from the 1920s, it's a concept of a business cycle. Okay, now we're going to talk about unemployment. How we measure it. Right? Let's do this. Definitions. Pay attention. This is not difficult. But you'll find that I'm going to ask you the type of question I would ask an exam. And even though I've told you what you need to know, you'll find out you don't have, don't understand it. Right? So watch. What is unemployment? What does it mean for the population of 7% unemployment, 10% unemployment? What does it mean? How do we measure that? We say, <clears throat> we first of all, we explain the adult population. The adult population, this is in Canada, by the way. In the US, it's 60 years or older. In Canada, it's 50 years or older. It's excluding territories and reservations. This is a minor point that was put in there. Essentially, the um, civilian non institutional population, what that means is, Everybody in Canada who's more than 15 and essentially able to work, if you're 95 years old and you're not in an old folks home and you're not in the military, you're not in jail, you're not in a reservation, and you want to work, you're part of the adult population. You could, fit, you could be working, right? You may not want to work, that's your choice. You can be 50, you don't have to work, but you're part of what we call the adult population. That's everybody over 50 who could conceivably work. People in the military are excluded. People in institutions such as jails, old folks' homes, hospitals, and the like are excluded. We can talk a little bit about that because when you compare uh, unemployment between countries, for example, comparing unemployment between Canada and the United States, Canada has a large military which might sop up a lot of unemployment. It does, by the way. Most of the people who volunteered for the uh, Iraq War or the war in Afghanistan were people who were unemployed. They got a job in the military and away they went. We don't have a military like that. In the US, they have a huge prison population. We don't, comparatively speaking. So in the US, some unemployment is hidden in prisons and the military, but it's relatively minor. You know, that's for more detailed work. But, so when you compare countries, if one country has 6% unemployment and another country has 4% unemployment, it might be something specific about the country. Again, in the US, we count people over 50, they count 60. So, you know, there's going to be some distinction uh, in any case. Now, the labor force is the sum of employed people and unemployed people. But we need to define each of these. The labor force is everybody who essentially wants to work. Not everybody who's physically able to work. Because there's retirees, there's housewives, there's this and that. There's people who don't want to work. They're students over 15. We're talking about people who want to work. Well, if the people who want to work, we have the employed. Now, this is how it's defined. The, now, listen carefully. The employed is the number of individuals who were employed, including self-employed, in goods and services production for pay, regardless of the amount, in the previous week, usually based on the previous month. So what happens is this. Stats can phones you sort of randomly, this is how they do it, this is called a household survey. You pick up the phone and they say to you, were you employed last month? They don't say, how long were you employed last month? You might have, for example, been employed in a bar for four hours helping out a friend, but your friend paid you. You say, yes, I was employed. Um, then you're counted as an employed person, right? Then they're gonna ask you, the second question they ask you is, how long were you but being employed just means you work for some money in the last week or the last month. Right, everybody? Remember. Okay, so that's an employed person. Doesn't matter how long you're employed, just that you were employed for any length of time during this month, paid by somebody else. If you said, yes, I was employed, I was working on my essay. No, 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 somebody else paid you. If they're paying you to work on their essay, you're employed. If you're working your own essay, you're not employed. You have to be getting some income from it. Employment includes if you're sick but you have a job, if you're on vacation but you have a job, if you're on strike on leave, you're considered to be employed. These are 
interesting variation. I can just go into a whole course, because I should teach this course, on employment. And unemployment is what it tells us something else. But not right now. Unemployment is the number of persons who are unemployed but are actively seeking work or are temporarily laid off. So basically in this room, there are people who probably don't have a job. You're a student. There may be people who have a job. But there may be some of you who don't have a job. You are not considered unemployed unless you are looking for work, actively looking for work, right? Now in Canada, weirdly, if you said when they phone you up, are you on, are you looking for work? You could say, well, you know, I looked for some jobs in the newspaper, which is pretty small. That's not really looking for work, you know. But that would be counted as looking for work. In the U.S., it's not. You have to be a little bit more active than that. But basically, you have to be looking for work. You said, no, I'm a student. I'm not looking for work then you're not unemployed. And of course you're not employed, it just means you're a member of the labor force. You're someone who could be working, but you're not. You're not a member of the labor force, right? Then there's what are called discouraged workers. These are people who really want jobs, but they're discouraged. They've given up looking for a job. And it turns out they're more significant than you think, particularly in recessions, because they've been looking for work for six months, whatever. They haven't been able to find any work. They've been putting in applications, and every time they went to get a job, or the person said, hey, there's 150 people with better qualifications than you, they're discouraged. They don't look anymore. They are not unemployed. These are some of the worst unemployed people in, in one respect than in the whole society. They're unemployed, they're unemployed for more than six months, but they're not counted as unemployed unless they're looking for work. These are discouraged workers. They won't even count them once upon a time. Now stats can in the US, the Bureau of Labor, tries to take some measure of them, but not month to month. Okay? Good. So for you people now, comes the moment of truth. Pretty soon. I'll leave this up. The labor force participation rate is the ratio, the percentage of the labor force, or the labor force, the number of workers who are employed or unemployed, as a percent of the adult population. And the unemployment rate is the number of people who are unemployed as a percent of the labor force. So the key thing here is to understand who is in the labor force. What employment concludes and does not include, what unemployment includes and does not include. All right, you ready? Here we go. Begin. I'll just go here. Let's just get rid of this. Let's say, the adult population of a country, get your, you're going to need your calculators, is 75 million. Now the population of the country might be 200 million, but 75 million of the population are over 15. The unemployed, or shall I say the employed, or let us say, 35 million. The unemployed, I'm going to say, are 3 million. Part time employment, it turns out, is 2 million. And discouraged workers. There's one million of those. Now I want to know the participation rate. Since we just discussed it, this is basically the percentage of the labor force divided by the adult uh, population. But I need to be able to identify these two here. And the unemployment rate. is the percentage unemployed divided by the labor force employed plus unemployed. Okay? All right, I'm going to give you all a minute to calculate those numbers, and then we're going to ask you what numbers you have. All right? This will be two marks on the upcoming exam.
Everybody, I'm just going to point to you and ask you for your number. I expect this calculation to be done. Nobody's safe. Participation rate one mark, and employment rate one mark. Okay, so let's do participation rate. I doubt that five, five of, no, I doubt that maybe ten, not much more than ten percent of this class will get this, both of these correct. Okay, participation rate, who's got a number for me? Yes. Uh, What's your name again, sorry? Uh, Nate. Nate? Nate. Nate, yes, Nate. Uh, 41 over 75. Okay. Why did God make calculators, Nate? He said, I don't know. Oh my uh, gosh. Uh, you left home without your calculator, Nate? Yikes. All right, 55%. 55, is there about 55%? Okay, 50, you can give me one decimal. Uh, 54. Okay, only because it might be this, it might be some competing thing. And what about, yeah, why not? What do you get for the young boy? Uh, the rest of you need to go to the time. What do you got to come up to come back? Who's got an unemployment rate for me? Did you include discouraged workers? Yeah. 
This is the total, the maximum number it could be. Do we include discouraged workers in the labor force? Go ahead, tell me why not. Uh, no, they don't want to work. They want to work, but no, because they're not actively seeking, seeking work. Forget that. That's not part of the labor force. Do we include part-time employment in the labor force? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but, do we add it to the three million? What should you be concerned with? Alexander. Alexander. What did you, did you include part-time? Who doesn't include part-time? Go ahead, why not? Because it's part of the employee. It's part of the employee. Remember I said, employment is everybody whether you work for like two hours or 40 hours or eight or nine hours. This is important, right? In this class, let's suppose everybody in this class is working 40 hours a week. So we'll say the employment is 40 people. Let's suppose you, there's a recession and you go down to 20 hours a week, but you all have a job. The change in, there's no change in employment. Part-time employment is a, dis, you know, can be a distortion. So you've got to be careful. The employment statistic doesn't distinguish by itself between part-time and full-time. It just says this is everybody who has a job. So for example, you can have no change in employment, but actually everybody's working half as much. Everybody's really important, okay? So normally the data is presented this way. They tell you how many people are employed, and then they tell you the part-time employment, and that's significant. Um, they tell you what the labor force is, they tell you um, what unemployed is. And so you've got to know that employed includes part-time, and so that could be a distortion, as we'll see. All right, so the answer here would be this number here, whatever this is, 35 plus three, which is 38. So the, the participation rate is going to be 38 divided by 75. And unemployment rate is going to be 3 divided by 35, 38. Everybody? Correct answer. Two marks in the upcoming exam. Make sure you understand it. Now, let us now look at the latest data. Uh, quickly. This is simple, but this is important measurement. 
In the first half of 2013, employment growth averaged 14,000 per month. Right? Jobs went up every month by 14,000. In the last six months of 2012, jobs went up by 27,000. Just keep in mind. The economy is slowing down, at least so far as creating jobs is concerned. Um, this is uh, this is not as good as it should be. The white too. This is uh, in terms of I'll go way down here for the chart uh, here. All right. Now notice this is the population in Canada, the adult population. Everybody, 28 million. It went up. Uh, from May to June 2013, in the last month, the adult population of Canada went up 37,000. Everybody? Where did they come from? Where did they come from? Might have been immigrants, might have been uh, people becoming 50, might have been people entering the labor force, etc. Maybe women entering the labor force, whatever. Here's the labor force. Uh, the population went up like this. But the labor force only went up by seven, not a whole lot. Employment fell by this amount. Now notice, basically the data says there was very little change in employment. Not many people, there weren't any jobs created. This is weird for Canada, because we've been averaging 14,000 plus. There were no jobs created. We lost 4,000 jobs. But I'm telling you, the, the report is worse than that. Most people will read, oh, Canada's lost 400 jobs, big deal. Not a huge thing. Actually, it's kind of significant because that's a lot fewer. We expect to make, get 10,000. But I'm telling you the report is even worse than that. Tell me. Notice, 32,000 full-time jobs were lost. And 32,000, or approximately 32,000 part-time jobs were gained. That's bad. That's bad. We lost full-time jobs and gained part-time jobs, replaced full-time jobs with part-time jobs. That is flat out bad. And then we also didn't gain any employment. This is a bad report, right? Now I'm telling you, you could have a report that said, we gained 14,000 jobs. Oh, great. But it could be that we gained 50,000 part-time jobs and we lose 36,000 full-time jobs. Not good. So you gotta look at both of them, everybody? Now notice the unemployment rate. Unemployment was 7.5. Hey, wait a minute. Why did unemployment go up? We only lost 4,000 jobs. Why did unemployment go up to 7.5? Look up here. Because 7,000 people entered the labor force. Everybody? 400 people lost their jobs, but unemployment went up by 7.5 because 7,000 people entered the labor force. Then what about the unemployment rate? The unemployment rate basically uh, it shows it didn't change very much, but it could have changed. Sometimes, for example, the economy could gain 14,000 jobs, which isn't bad, but 30,000 people enter the labor force, and there, for whatever reasons, discouraged workers enter the labor force, and then the unemployment rate goes up. You can't pay attention to the unemployment rate. You must pay attention to the change in employment. That's the number one thing, right? Unemployment rate can go up because there's more jobs lost. There's not, you know, we lose jobs. Or people enter the labor force because there's so many jobs. Actually, at the beginning of in recoveries, it's fairly common for people to scurry back into the labor force as soon as they see a new job, everybody goes into the labor force and the unemployment rate goes up, up, and up. But actually there's jobs being created. Everybody? So read my notes and get a sense of this. All right. Uh, now notice, everybody, the U.S. economy is about 10 times the size of the Canadian economy. So 14,000 jobs in the U.S. means 140,000 jobs. Sorry, 14,000 new jobs in Canada is 140,000 jobs. That's roughly the way the U.S. has performed for the last three or four years, although they're doing a little better now. <clears throat> but 28,000 jobs in the previous months is way beyond it. If Obama got 280,000 jobs,